Hello everybody and welcome to today's episode. I am joined by Dr. Claire Burley. Now Claire is a clinical psychologist specializing in attachment trauma. Her background in the NHS was supporting families where their children were fostered or adopted and now she works in private practice seeing adults to heal the impact of their own attachment history. I cannot tell you how excited I am to have this conversation with Dr. Claire today. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's absolute pleasure. Absolute pleasure. I feel like attachment, trauma, our own trauma, our fears of creating trauma in our little ones are such a big part of parenting. And especially for some reason, especially around sleep. And, Mm. you know, we apply more, I think, concern around this when it comes to sleep than we do to uh, things like a tantrum in the supermarket. You know, we don't seem to give that a second thought, but then we do when it comes to sleep. So I can't wait to delve into this today, Claire. Um, Let's kick off then with a question that's on the tip of my tongue, and I'm sure all of our listeners. Um, And feel free to introduce a little bit about how this has sort of come into your practice. But can you talk to us a bit about what attachment trauma actually is? Yeah, so it's helpful to start off with just defining the word attachment, because especially in the um, world of parenting, it can mean so many different things to different people. Um, So attachment, what we mean in the psychology world is the relationship we have with our caregivers growing up. Obviously, now people talk about attachment as well in terms of relationships. But the origins of that theory really started with, well, it was primarily mother and baby. And it's the relationship dynamics that we have with uh, between a parent and caregiver, sorry, parent or caregiver and child um, when we're growing up. So the idea is when we're born, we're highly dependent upon another to take care of us. We can't meet our own needs. And for a quite prolonged period of time, we can't meet our own needs. So we need proximity to a safe adult to take care of us for us to be able to survive. Yeah. So we develop these attachment relationships, these attachment behaviours designed to keep our parent or caregiver close to us. We need that proximity in order for safety. So there are certain things that we really need our parent or caregiver to be able to do in order for us to feel safe. Obviously, we need our physical needs met, but also our emotional needs. And this is where the link is with the sleep, because this is one that triggers a lot of parents around emotion. It's the emotion of sleep and bedtime and separation. That's the trigger. So in terms of attachment theory, we have different attachment styles. And what they found is that they can predict the attachment style of a baby based on the attachment style of the of the mother during pregnancy. Wow. They're not they're not fixed. It's not set. And we can change our attachment style. But they can predict um, because we lead as parent, we lead that attachment relationship. So there's basically four styles of attachment. There's secure, which is the majority of people have a secure attachment. Um, And what that means in terms of the relationship between parent and baby is baby feels safe to seek closeness and comfort from us. And also they feel supported to go off for their other needs, which is to explore their environment because as babies grow and develop, we, we need those developmental experiences of being able to go off and explore our world in order to grow and develop. So that's the secure pattern. We have two types of insecure patterns, and this is where things can just get a little bit um, off track, is the insecure ambivalent pattern is where if we have a parent, um, and we'll say mother, but, we, but I mean both either parent, if we have a mum who is inconsistently available and, and not just once, but over time. So sometimes they're there and they're meeting our needs and sometimes they're not. Um, then we can develop what's called an insecure, ambivalent or anxious, preoccupied attachment style. And that's where baby or toddler sort of clings. This is the clingy child that's not able to go off and explore their environment. They want to stay close to mum. And the idea of this is if mum is inconsistent and we're not sure when she's going to be available, we have to stay close. We have to stay with her so that when she is available, she's there to meet our needs. We're not going to go off into the world because we might get forgotten. Hmm. The other insecure style is the avoidance style. And this is where we have a parent who tends not to be responsive. 
So um, maybe comes with the idea that, you know, we should sort of toughen up and keep a kind of stiff upper lip, you know, pull your socks up, you know, keep look after yourself. Um, so what then the, the child learns is, I, you know, I, I don't need to go to mum to meet those proximity needs for closeness and connection because um, that's not going to be the way that I want it to be. So I'll just stay in the environment. And these are the kids who just stay um keep themselves to themselves and just sort of stay in the environment um, and don't seek that closeness with parent. Mm -hmm. And then the fourth style is the one that tends to come where there's a lot of trauma and fear. So if we have a parent who is themselves frightened or is frightening, so in the cases of abuse um, or domestic violence, um, substance abuse, things like that, where our parent is supposed to be the source of safety, but is also actually the source of threat, then we can develop this disorganized attachment style where there's no, no clear strategy. Mm -hmm. I can't come to you. I can't stay away from you. There's no clear safety. Mm -hmm. So in short, they're the four styles. Where the trauma comes in, obviously with disorganized attachment, um, there's a, a trauma around safety. But the other forms of trauma, and I, um, when I say trauma, I don't just mean abuse. Mm -hmm that's a clearer form of trauma but really an attachment trauma what I'm talking about is overwhelming experiences that we have with our parent or caregiver um, where we felt unable to cope and didn't have it was the absence of the supportive caregiver that made it feel overwhelming mm -hmm. and usually that's because there's a threat to our relationship with them or we feel a sense of threat in terms of our own self-worth or, or self-esteem and that's really what I mean by trauma. So we can have really loving parents who are doing great at parenting and, and just being human and human life happens. And those can create certain experiences that if those recur over time are the things that we then carry into our adulthood. The key there is it's repetition. It's not necessarily the one off. Yeah. Yeah. So for example, if with the second description you gave um this is where I think there can be some confusion or fear around mm. like what what would that include because I know you said like it could be where there's been an inconsistency so mm. you know mum was there then she wasn't or they can't they're not sure will will she be there can I rely on this or not are there obviously I know you have in your past worked in um, fostering and uh, situations where that would be very clear, very apparent with a parent who isn't there all the time um, and a child that can't rely on that. Um, what would be some examples of that in day-to-day -day life in the home where the parents are there physically, that they're not obviously in care or anything? Like what would be some examples? Yeah, so oftentimes the parent is there physically, um, but it's the emotional Mm -hmm. um, unavailability so it could be somebody who's having particular life challenges right now where maybe they're having marital difficulties or they're having mental health difficulties so that the emotional presence the emotional availability is inconsistent sometimes they feel resourced and are able to do it other times they're lacking that emotional regulation themselves so in those times the children can't reach them for closeness or for comfort because it's those two things we we want to be able to have proximity in terms of feeling um connected mm. but it's also the emotional regulation piece which again we'll talk about with regards to sleep yeah. we need an emotionally regulated caregiver to um, to feel emotionally regulated ourselves as infants mm -hmm. so it, we don't learn to emotionally regulate on our own at that young age what we need is those emotionally regulated interactions where we feel soothed and calmed by another person's nervous system a calm nervous system mm -hmm. and that's how we then internalize that process so that when we grow up we're later able to self-soothe and, and to emotionally regulate ourselves mm -hmm. but to start with we need to be regulated and then we co-regulate and then we're able to do it ourselves yeah so if somebody is having those struggles where they're they're not feeling emotionally resourced um or they're they're feeling shut down um, distracted, um, emotionally dysregulated, um, consistently or, or inconsistently. Um, they're the sorts of things where we can develop an insecure attachment style, but it is over time. Mm. So it's not that one day where you just had a hard day and you just couldn't really be there for, for that 
bedtime period it's not the one-offs it's over time it's that it's that experience repeated experience over time Mm, yeah because I can imagine sometimes your mum's got to take a work trip and that's okay she's not there at bedtime but usually she is or would you um I mean I'm guessing that there'd be cases where a parent wouldn't be aware they would have no real awareness that they are kind of emotionally unavailable that they wouldn't consciously Mm. know that they are operating in that way or giving that off um what would how could you then how could you sense check that as a parent and go hmm Mm. am I am I emotionally available to my child or like is there anything that you can do as a parent to ask yourself any questions there yeah this one is a tough one because we have blind spots yeah and and these patterns are really based on our own attachment histories Mm-hmm. So, you know, we we grow up as adults and then become parents and we're carrying our own attachment histories into that parenting relationship when we parent our own children. So a good place to start is to look back and, and, and think, how was my childhood? What did my parents do when I was upset? Could I go to them for comfort? Did I feel emotionally safe? Did I feel soothed? Um, did I feel loved? Lots of people come into therapy and they say, <clears throat> excuse me, they say, you know, my, my childhood was fine. You know, I had loving parents, you know, my childhood was good because there's, there's not necessarily um, abuse or clear trauma. So these aren't things that we necessarily recognize. These are the sorts of things that happened in the everyday. They're not the things that stood out. And because they're in the everyday, we we can't necessarily put our finger on them. We don't necessarily have a clear memory of that. Um, and the other thing is when we're growing up, we tend to internalize these experiences to say something about us. Mm-hmm. So we don't sit there and think, oh, my mum's not available tonight because she's had a hard day or there's something going on in the, in my parents' lives right now, which means they're, they're less emotionally resourced. We don't think that. Right. We have no capacity to see that wider picture. What we do is, as children is we internalize it. This must mean something about me. It must mean that I'm not lovable or that I'm not being a good girl or a good boy, or that I'm not worthy of care. And so because we internalize it, we don't, um, we don't remember that experience, we just carry that meaning, that layer of meaning, which is how we try and make sense of our world. So this is where we get the blind spots. So it's helpful to reflect back on some of those questions. Did I feel loved growing up? Did I feel like who I am is okay for my parents? Did I feel like I had to be somebody else? Could I go to them um, when I needed support? Did we talk about things? How did my parents respond to my emotions? Were my emotions okay? How did they discipline me? How did I feel in those moments of discipline or afterwards? When we start to unpick those sorts of questions from our own background, we can start to look at how we coped with that. So did I cope by shutting down and withdrawing, which would be more of the avoidance style? Or did I cope by trying to communicate my emotion? Maybe... um, we might have heard stories around being inconsolable if we're inconsolable and we're with we struggle to be soothed that's a sign of a more ambivalent anxious ambivalent style of attachment if we shut down and we didn't show our emotion it's a sign of a more avoidant attachment Mm. so we can start to just reflect on those things um it's helpful to reflect on our histories but we can also reflect on our current life how do i respond now to those things what are those types of patterns that I notice in myself? So, yeah, it's really helpful to get really reflective of that um, and and just look at the way that we feel internally and then the way that we respond externally. Mm. I think as parents as well, if if there is anything you didn't particularly like um, growing up, sometimes we go, I'll never be like that. And then we actually are and we don't even realise that we are, um, which I do see in a, you know, light sense. I see that with people that are like, oh I'd never I'd never do that I'd never be like my parents and then yeah doing the same thing <laughs> same patterns that it must be generations deep some of this stuff mm-hmm. yeah it's really fascinating and actually how if we look at ourselves we can often find the the answers yeah. so when it comes to then our own attachment trauma potentially and the way we parent with say a crying baby which is something I know lots of our parents Mm. have to see to and we all respond differently to that we're wired to respond to the crying of our young that's nature Mm. that's normal and I know that some people find that more 
stressful than others or more triggering than others. Um, I know that I was like, I've got to make it stop. I've got to make it stop. Like it's my duty. Baby's crying, fix it. Like that's, I'm a fixer. <laughs> um, and even now, sometimes when a baby's crying, I, 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 I'm like, oh, I need to make that go away. Like I need to make that stop. I'm not annoyed with them. I just want to fix it. Yeah. Um, how how can we yeah how what 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 can we do to think about our own attachment traumas and response to crying and that sort of thing mm. yeah absolutely because emotion and attachment is so closely linked together because of, of what i was saying about being um regulated yeah mm. so if in our upbringing um we felt that emotions were overwhelming and therefore we would get stuck in our emotions our emotions felt incredibly unpleasant and they felt like they weren't ever going to end then we will be more activated by our babies and children's emotions now as adults mm. because we never felt that emotions were safe if we weren't supported in our emotional regulation then emotions don't feel safe mm. and we've developed strategies for that as adults as to how we manage our own emotions now um, but our babies can can trigger that nervous system response where it, they can't use the same strategies that we use. And so we're then faced with that same kind of um, internal response of this isn't safe. This isn't this doesn't feel OK for this emotion to be here. We need to get rid of it. Mm. And, and that's if we have a very strong reaction, we're supposed to have a reaction to our children, as you say, <clears throat> If, if we notice the emotion, we're able to stay emotionally regulated and calm, and then we're soothing our baby, that's a sign of a secure attachment. If we get triggered into a sort of anxiety or, or, or kind of anxious panic, it's potentially a sign of a, an insecure ambivalent style of attachment where that those emotions feel really challenging, they feel really threatening, there's a sense of this is really bad or wrong, mm. or... Um, shouldn't be allowed to be here. We need to get rid of it as quickly as possible. Mm. But then you'll also get mums and, and, and dads who don't respond as much to crying, who are a bit more dismissive, a bit more nonchalant about it, um, and, and don't necessarily register it as much, which is the kind of opposite to what, what you're saying, which is maybe a sign of a more avoidant attachment style, that shutting down of emotion, that cutting off, mm. not registering and being maybe quite numb to emotion that's more of a sign of an avoidant mm. so again it's really helpful for us to know our own style yeah. if we are more of the anxious ambivalent where we get triggered by our children crying job one is to self-regulate it's not it's not necessarily to leave baby while we do that although we might need to for a time um but but we need to focus on being regulated ourselves because if we're coming to our baby and we're feeling activated and we're feeling dysregulated we won't be soothing to them in the same way. Mm. So we really have to either do it at the same time or take some deep breaths and, 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 and attend to our own emotional reaction first and then come to our baby able to soothe, able to show them that they're safe, that this emotion is okay, that this emotion will pass, that they're supporting in the, in the way that they're feeling right now because they're, they're taking those cues from us. This emotion isn't anything to be scared about. Nothing bad is going to happen. We're coming with that soothing, calming presence. Yeah, and I think when we can apply some meaning as well to the crying and the need, uh, yeah, sometimes the baby's just really hungry and it's time for some milk. Um, but I, again, I don't know, you, you can tell me, but if you have your own history or triggers that crying means distress fear sadness even um and you desperately want to make sure that your child doesn't feel distressed or afraid or sad yeah you're going to feel more frantic about that response than if you're like oh it's fine it's just a dirty nappy we can sort that out and yeah. I think it's having that um uh calm around what is the need and and meeting that need and not yeah. panicking and thinking oh, every time my baby's crying they must be so upset or emotionally it's not all negative I guess is what I'm saying that crying doesn't yeah. especially with babies it's communication mm. it might just be asking for something not not necessarily telling you that something's bad or wrong or yeah absolutely one of the really helpful things to remind ourselves is that the reaction that we're having internally 
is a response from our past, not necessarily a response to our baby's present. Yeah. And that our baby isn't feeling the same things that we were feeling back then. Mm. And when we can catch that, and, and it's that, like you say, it's that meaning layer. It's the way we're interpreting it. If we're able to catch it and say, I know that I'm having this response right now because of my history, because of my background, then it calms our, us down because we're able to identify that there is no threat currently. There's no danger currently. My child isn't traumatized or um, distressed beyond repair. This is a, a nervous system reaction to my own past, my own history. And so everything is okay. And I can respond to my baby right now in a way where my baby won't be feeling the same things that I was feeling back then. Yeah. Yeah. And that's it. And, and the very fact that you're responding already, you know that your mm. baby is not going to feel like you aren't there or aren't available or that they are left abandoned or in danger. They know that they do have a caregiver there to support them. So far better if we can do that from a place of calm and rational and not not panic and um um yeah so you talked about self-regulation and I uh, this topic I love and I think one of the most confusing things now that we live in an age of media social media and so many messages that get out there that which is so great in so many ways um but can be very confusing and can if anything create more anxiety in parents because like well should I be doing this or should I be doing this what do I do what's right what's wrong what's good what's bad and we all um want to do our absolute best and we talk quite a lot in the world of sleep about self-regulation because it is a form like when we settle ourselves to sleep that's a self-regulation one of the earliest forms of self-regulation and is something that we do want to develop but you said early on how it develops over time it's not something we just have it's not something we're born with and personally, I'm very passionate about helping parents to work with their little ones in that development of that. We don't just expect one night to be able to place them down and they just miraculously can self-regulate. It's not, it's like riding a bike, you know, it takes practice, it takes time. But likewise, if we forever do it for them, and don't give them any room, like you say, that safe exploration, and give them any room to to have that practice or to feel that sensation in their body of oh I'm falling to sleep now and I'm safe and everything is okay then they're potentially not going to develop that as quickly which is when you see seven-year-olds still co-sleeping with their parents because they don't feel safe to be in their own bed in their own mm -hmm. room um how do we um I guess reassure parents about the coexistence of self-regulation developing nicely and still instilling a secure attachment and your child feeling safe and responded to. Mm, because yeah. I think people don't realize they can coexist and they, you know, they definitely can. Yes, absolutely. I think one of the key messages here is we can't stop our children from feeling anything. Mm. The goal isn't to never allow our children to feel anything um, because what we're actually giving them the message is it's not safe to feel. If we have to jump in and uh, and prevent any sort of challenge or any sort of emotion, then really what we're telling our kids is these things are bad and we don't want you to have them. Mm. Actually, what we want to be teaching our children is competency. So, you know, I'm here to support you. You're not on your own, um, but it's OK to be feeling different things. It's OK to go off and explore the world and maybe fall over because nothing bad is going to happen. Or it's okay if you feel sad or frustrated or disappointed or angry. You know, these emotions are all okay. If we're trying to um, cut those off, we're not giving our children the capacity to feel and master those emotions and those life challenges. We are there to support them through that. And it's, it's about picking the ages where it's age appropriate to allow them more room. So we're doing that, as you say, we're supporting that development as they grow older. The thing about the sleep is for children, for babe, for infants to know that we will be coming back. Yeah. The, the reason why people get so um, worried about the impact of, of letting babies cry is because, as you know, this is obviously the stuff you talk about is, you know, a generation ago, babies were left to cry 
until they fell asleep, mm. however long that takes. If that's two hours, they're crying for two hours. We're not talking about that. That's yeah. not an, an appropriate amount of time. But if you're leaving a baby or an infant um, for a couple of minutes, it's okay. Because then if they haven't started to um, calm, then you come back in and support. Yeah. And so the baby isn't left feeling like they're on their own. Yeah, It's okay to have gaps because we're coming back. Yeah. And the baby learns that we're coming back. So it's it's really, I mean, with the, the premise of, of parenting is, um, you know, if we take it from attachment literature, it's A-R-E accessibility our availability our responsiveness and how engaged we are and this is where the wider context is important not just the bedtime context yeah definitely. because if we're doing this all through the day every day and we are available so the baby is so the, our availability is can i reach you if i need you will you come and that's the coming back part of the sleep training so if i cry will you come back or if I need you during the day, will you be there? That's the accessibility piece. The responsiveness is, will you respond in a way that's supportive and soothing and nurturing rather than, I mean, we can all have moments of frustration as parents, can't we, where we may maybe not responding in the way that we would really like to, but we want to um, have a response where we're giving support. We're, we're coming from that more empathy place, um, that regulated place to calm and soothe. And then the engaged is, you know, do I matter to you? Are you spending time with me? Are we having playtime together? If we have a context where we're getting that ARE in throughout the day, and then we have a bedtime where we're, we're able to come in and out um, to support that baby with that development, this isn't traumatizing. Hmm. No. And it's especially, I think if, you, if you, you're a first time parent and you have one child, and they are literally the center of your universe it can be harder to differentiate if you have multiple children you just start to through default have those gaps because you can't necessarily be with both or more than two even simultaneously so sometimes with siblings yes one's going to wait because the other's got you and then they're going to wait and so on and yeah. it just comes naturally but if it is one and one center of your universe it can feel like a lifetime if you are not there that second is like I just need to go to the toilet and then I'll be with you and that that's okay um something you touched on there just made me think oh my goodness what if you have a child that's at nursery or even a baby and lots of parents do lots of um, families now have both parents working and we see this all the time with the nursery drop off and that uh, it's so upsetting if your child is upset. Mm. Um, and I, I completely understand about that learning that you come back and um, the closeness and the time you do have together. Mm. But technically, if you're not there and there at nursery, you're not available to them during the day. Mm. And yeah. is that something because I would hate to, I'm slightly worrying about my own um, early parenthood and when my children spent time at nursery. And I'm sure parents will hear that and go, oh my God, I'm not there. I'm not there. I'm at work. Like, mm -hmm. how does that Yeah. Work? And that's the other message is that, um, you know, when we say it takes a village, you know, it's okay that our children have substitute attachment figures. Okay. So it's so, not that nobody's there. It's, it's yes. Mm. So um, obviously, the way that that was designed was, you know, extended family or or in a village, literally a community of people that the child knows. Mm -hmm. And this is why it's really important when we're choosing which nursery setting we're, we're picking for our kids and um, and how the handover goes. What we're saying to our babies or toddlers or, or preschoolers is this is a safe adult who is a substitute attachment figure who will be there for you when I'm not here. Mm. And that's okay. We're, we're able to do that. We're able to form multiple attachments. And this is why it's key when we're picking a nursery that we choose one where they focus on the relationship. They focus on nurture and soothing and warmth and playfulness rather than discipline or rules or, you know, those things aren't needed mm. at, at that age. Um, so I did the same thing. My kids, my kids went to nursery, um, but I was really careful. And I asked specific questions when I looked around the nurseries to make sure that that's 
the approach that they were coming from. Mm. So I'd ask questions like, um, you know, if two toddlers were arguing over a toy, how would you respond? And the nurseries that said, well, you know, we discipline the child that was taking the toy and um, we'd support the one who was hurt. And I, I, I then discounted those nurseries because this isn't about discipline. Yes, we want to teach our children to share, but actually we want to support all children not just certain children um, and we want to be coming with a emotionally supportive response first before we do the teach yeah that's what's key when they're that age do you know my daughter she's 11 and a half as I as I record this and she has a memory that is so almost infuriating now to know but she couldn't articulate this until she was much older mm -hmm. she has a memory of nursery probably more the preschool age. So she was probably three or four. Um, and her teddy, which she still has now, but it's this, this one of these like forever teddies that you'll always have, even as an adult, like somewhere safe. Um, she used to take that to nursery. And she has a memory of a, a key worker who wasn't her usual key worker, wasn't somebody she had a relationship with, um, took it away from her. And oh. she was so upset about this. And when she couldn't, you know, she didn't tell me about this at the time. And she, she's told me once she's much, much older. And even now we, she, she almost jokes about it. She's like, she was so mean. She took away my teddy. But I've asked her the story and she said, I said, what, why, what were you doing? What, you know, and she said, I think it was some kind of quiet time or something. And, and she wasn't listening or she was um, mm -hmm. playing or something. And she, I mean, she's not particularly loud or disruptive kind of child, but she obviously was a bit distracted um, maybe like me, she may, she may have ADHD traits. I don't know, but either way it was nothing, don't, no, nothing terrible, but her mm. teddy was taken and put on a high shelf out of her reach. And it was a, you can't have that. And once I've heard about this, obviously years later, I'm like that, like, I, I feel terrible. I'm like, I am so sorry. I put you in that environment. I am so sorry that that happened to you. And we've talked about it, which I hope is the best way to heal um, and overcome that. And she knows that that's not okay. She knows that that yeah. wasn't, that wasn't okay. And that I uh, agree that that wasn't okay. Yeah. Um, but I love the way you're approaching this with, you know, how to ask those questions. And I would say, to keep asking them because staff turnover, change of people, things we can't control in a nursery setting. Um, yeah. Absolutely. That, you know, and that's um, a memory. She's not forgotten that now, you know. No, absolutely. Because we can't be withdrawing comfort as a, as a way of disciplining ever. Yeah. Um, the two things are separate. Actually, we should be offering comfort whilst we're disciplining. And by disciplining, I don't mean naughty steps or anything like that. I, I mean, a teach. Essentially, that's what it is. We're trying to teach and guide our children mm -hmm. um, to whatever it is, whether it's um, interpersonally, so sharing or I mean, I, I personally don't think we have to force kids to share. I feel like um, we should be supporting them emotionally in whatever it is that we're trying to teach them. Never withholding comfort, never withholding safety or connection even if it's to a teddy we shouldn't be taking that away as, as a way of trying to teach because that's not the right way of doing it um it's if those sorts of experiences do happen and they will and, and, and if it's not at nursery it'll be at school because again the school systems are not set up in this way either um so there will be our children will have those experiences the best thing we can do as adults as parents is what you did which is to talk it through and say i'm so sorry that happened to you Mm. that shouldn't have happened mm. because in that moment that's validating our child ex experience and it's mm. giving them a voice it's honoring their uh, witnessing what they went through and letting them know that whilst that we weren't there at the time that happened we're there for them now mm. and we're hearing it now and we're able to offer them comfort and soothing now you know and, and now she's able to joke about that that's you know a sign that it's lighter for her mm. um, but when we hear about these things you know we have to then do that kind of rupture repair yeah well, I wasn't there for you in that moment but I'm here listening now and I'm offering you that response now and validating you know yeah. it's not to be able to say to children not all adults are the same you know not all adults will respond in the same way and if an adult's responded in a way that we don't agree with it's okay to say we don't agree with the way they did that yeah because it's validating and if we make mistakes ourselves, because like you said, we're only human and we do. And I'm sure 
um, I mean, certainly I know my mum goes, oh, I, I shouldn't have done this. And, you know, and, and I, I have the moment, oh, I wish I'd, I wish I'd responded differently in that moment. Mm. Or oh, I wish I hadn't said that. Like, how can we, I, or is it things like this and talking about it that we can, to some extent, course correct and not think, oh my gosh, I've damaged my child's life. Because we know that the brain is um, very changeable. And we've learned so much over the past even decade in the, how the brain works and it's not set in stone. Mm. So if we do think or draw upon memories or occurrences where we think, I really wish I hadn't handled it that way. Or if somebody's even listened to this today and thought, oh my goodness, I have got X, Y, Z like so wrong. I really want to change that. Like, How do we course correct? Yeah, absolutely. Well, there's a couple of things. One is we don't want to go into self-blame. No. <laughs> too heavily. Yeah, easily done. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, the mum guilt is real, isn't it? Uh-huh, um, yeah. So if we are feeling a lot of self-blame or we're, we're chastising ourselves or we're really beating ourselves up about it, first job is to process that ourselves first because what we don't want to do is enter into a conversation with our child where we're self-blaming yeah. too heavily. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's job one and then job two yeah absolutely it's never too late we've never missed the window to be able to do a repair piece even if this is something that happened a couple of years ago we can still go to our child and say you know what I was just thinking about this thing that happened whenever it was and I was reflecting on that and I was really wanting to talk to you about that how did you experience it? What was that like for you? And really do that repair piece then because it's never too late for our kids. You know, even as adults, I'll have adults come to me for therapy and something happened 30 years ago. If their parent came to them now and said, I'm so sorry that I responded that way, it would still be healing now, 30 years later. Mm. So it's never too late. Um, Our kids, you know, they want to feel heard. They want to feel seen. They want to feel like their emotions are understandable, that they're being witnessed. And we can do that at any time. You know, ideally, we would do that as we go along. You know, I think a generation ago, our parents would never say, I'm sorry, I got that wrong. Or, you know, I made a mistake, you know, that culturally, that wasn't really done. Mm. It's okay to do that. What we're modeling is we're human too. It's okay to make mistakes. I make mistakes, you're going to make mistakes. I can forgive myself for my mistakes. You can forgive yourself for your mistakes. We're modeling that this is human nature. We're going to get it wrong at times, but we can reflect, we can process, and then we can come back to it because we're doing that rupture repair. Yeah, I really love that. That's actually so reassuring. And in turn, that probably then further teaches um, being brave and trying things and doing things because if we're always so afraid of getting it wrong or failing then we're going to keep ourselves very small um, and not take risks and explore in the way that we really could. So it's it's got another lesson to it there, hasn't it as well, exactly. which is amazing. Oh, Claire, I love that. I could talk to you all day and <laughs> pick your brains on so many things, but um, I know we do need to wrap up. Um, is there anything else that you feel like compelled or that you wanted to share today that I haven't covered or have I covered everything? Is there anything you wanted to... Yeah, I mean, I think that the the overarching message when it comes to attachment and parenting is, you know, this dual thing, you know, it's not just all about how we show up for our kids. um, And it's not all about us as people, it's both, Mm -hmm. you know, let's do the internal work, let's reflect on our own emotions, let's reflect on our own histories. How do we manage um, challenges now? How do we manage our emotions now? And if there's stuff from our history, our background, you know, let's work on that. You know, it's never too late for us to do our own healing because it will have an impact on how we feel about ourselves, how we show up as parents. It will impact our relationships with our partners, our our family members. So it's really helpful to do that piece um, when we get time. I know it's really challenging when our when our um, children are a, a little, um, but it's really helpful to do as a as something not to forget about. And then in terms of the parenting piece, you know, our kids really essentially just want to feel loved. So if we're giving them our love, we're giving them affection, we're showing up for them, we're giving them our time, um, we're playing with them, we are attending to them. You know, that's the basis. We can make lots of mistakes 
and it not create some sort of lasting trauma if we've got those basics right. So having faith in our connection with them, having faith in our relationship with them and our ability to course correct if we feel like we're going off track because things do change as our kids get older. We have to tweak things and, and amend the way we're doing things as they grow up. Um, that's okay. It's okay to make some mistakes. If we have that core foundation there, which anyone listening to this will do because, you know, they're thinking about it to be listening to this. They're, yeah. they're trying to reflect. They're trying to, um, you know, I guess, try and do the best that they can. Yeah. Um, then, you know, the, these are the parents, we, you know, we all care. Yeah. We care yeah. about the way that we're doing this. Um, so having faith in that and knowing that, um, you know, there are, like you say, our, our ability to um, grow and mm-hmm. to um heal and repair is there so if we make some mistakes here and there it's okay yeah definitely no that's so reassuring thank you so so much and I think it just sits so importantly alongside sleep and working towards healthy sleep because they uh, you know they are integral to each other they're you know they you need healthy sleep you need healthy attachment um you can have both and I love that you talked as well about the daytime and if you can instill these things in the ARE during the day and all the time just consistently it's going to make those bedtimes and that sleep a lot easier as well Mm -hmm. so um really reassuring to have this conversation today I'm so so grateful for you being here Um, Dr. Claire Burley can be found on Instagram. Um, where, if people wanted to get in touch with you, Claire, where's the best place for them to find you? They can can get in touch through Instagram, um, or on my website, um, drclaire.com. We will put some links to you in the show notes so that people can check out. I absolutely love reading your Instagram feed. Some of the things that pop up on them, I'm like, oh, there's a thinker. <laughs> and it really, it's really great. So thank you again so much for being here today. Thank you for having me.